Meanwhile, at Seventh Heaven, and I guess we talked about, is it a club? Is it, and it's on TV. Is it a club? It's on TV. It's also a lot like. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's fine. <laughs> I was just trying, trying to open my soda. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. People, I I have said for weeks that we cover the greatest era of action movies. This is going to be a good one. Just hold on. I am not playing around this time. This is hands down, when it comes to karate movies, probably in the top 10 of karate movies. Now, there's, there's all kinds of different types of karate movies. There's ones that are very serious. There's ones that have great action sequences. There's ones with people who never learn their lesson and just keep gambling every week. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, just top to bottom, is fantastic. Of course, I'm talking about the 1985 classic, The Last Dragon, which originally premiered on March 22nd, 1985. It is directed by Michael Schultz, a very accomplished director. Uh, he did tons of TV work, continues to do TV work. He also directed the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, which is the movie that came out way later than the album. So it uses the music from the album, but it starred the Bee Gees. Which is always weird to me. I don't understand that. <laughs> How do those two relate? The it wasn't the well received. <laughs> well, it's very much a cult movie now. <laughs> oh, and of course, he directed the 1976 classic Car Wash, which is another one we got to find a way to work into the podcast schedule, like that we can talk about Car Wash yeah, so- that somehow. Great. It is written so. by Louis Van Osta. Who doesn't have a Wikipedia? So there's so that. So that's that. Yeah, there's that guy. I did read about him. He's yeah, an accomplished he writer. Who knows? <laughs> he, I read about him. He somewhere else. He is an accomplished writer. He's apparently not good enough for not- Wikipedia. <laughs> not to Wikipedia. <laughs> they got standards apparently. He makes medical yeah. textbooks now. It's not important. Now sometimes we like to pause and say, "Hey." This is the producer on the movie. We don't talk about him a bunch. But when someone big comes up, we got to mention the producers. And for this movie, this is a big one. He's going to come up multiple times in this podcast. The producers were Rupert Hitzig and Barry Gordy. Now, those that you like, Barry Gordy. Man, that name sounds so familiar. Let me just set the stage for you. It's 1957. He had written a song. It was kind of popular. He's out and he finds a little band called the Miracles. A small one. Just a little one. Just a little (laughs) tiny small band. He finds a small band. Yeah. And the front man of that band gives him some coaching advice and says, you should start a record label. And that man's name was Smokey Robinson. And that record label ended up becoming Motown Records. And in this period of time, in 1986, recently, Vanity, the star of this movie, had recently left Prince's label and joined, guess what, Motown Records. Yeah, so there's lots of crossover as to why the cast is the way that it is. Also, the music, because, you know, it's Motown. You might recognize some of the acts, the music acts that were on Motown, like the Temptations, The Supremes, Marvin Gaye, The Commodore, Stevie Wonder, mm-hmm. The Jackson 5, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Just little bands you may have heard of here <laughs> Icons, and there. Yeah, you know. You know yeah. Oh, the greatest you can bands imagine, of all time. You could just imagine the music in this movie is very good. Like, like <laughs> this is actually a soundtrack you might want to go out and buy. <laughs> And we it's... don't get those every week. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think we've got those anytime. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that brother's lounge singing is not going to make it on a record. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, there's a lot of talent behind this movie that, like, in the production end of it. Now, we're going to find out later. The people that they chose to be in the movie... They were very green. (laughs) They were very new to (laughs) acting. All in all, seriously, why we chose this movie to be in this rundown, in this season of the podcast, is because it is so, so good. It is so good. I will find Mm -hmm. any excuse to watch it. Oh, yeah. I love this movie. And I felt like when we were talking about what movie would represent New York, we all uh, instantly agreed that we wanted this one to be it because of Bruce Leroy. Exactly. the man. (laughs) (laughs) There was only three guarantees. Like when we started the the season, like, okay, for sure, 
no retreat, no surrender, Miami Connection, and The Last Dragon. Everything else is up in the air. Everything yep. else is debatable. Those ones were not debatable. Nope. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I cannot wait. I cannot wait to talk about this movie and everything that happens in it. I have such a fondness for Timok, and it's one of the saddest days of my life <laughs> that I did not take the opportunity to go talk to him. And I was there. I mean, yes. You were, you were torn, though. It was a- I got to see an actor who was in the room, which is another movie that I absolutely adore. But it, it was wasn't like mock. it was Tommy, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> Without much further ado, let's get into The Last Dragon, because there is a ton to talk about with this movie. Music, cast, action sequences, the glow, <laughs> show <Shown> up. <laughs> we got to talk about all of it. Let's go break this one down. So when we open up, just right from the very beginning, we get told that the main actor in this movie who's playing Leroy, he's actually good at karate. Unlike some of the other (laughs) movies we have watched this season. Deadly (laughs) butt. Yes. Yes. It really starts off like high tape. He's just doing kind of an exercise routine. And then his sensei quickly starts trying to kill him with arrows. (laughs) (laughs) Like they do. (laughs) And I love that they introduced this in the very, very beginning, that he's searching for the glow, that he's reached peak training. So it's not like he's just getting started. He's in the middle and he's going to discover that he's good at karate. He already knows he's good at it. He already knows he's great at it. He's just searching this higher enlightenment. Yeah, he's trying to be like upper echelon, like the t- the best of the best, like Bruce Lee. Suck it, Jeff Wincott. <laughs> <laughs> you are not going to reach that. Sorry. <laughs> You have reached taxi cab driver, maybe, <laughs> maybe bartender level. <laughs> and guys, Ty Lock might have been the perfect person to play Bruce Leroy or Leroy Green, as he's in the in the credits. He actually held black belts in Goju Ryu Karate, Jeet Kune Do, Wing Chun, Hapkido, Jiu Jitsu, Taekwondo, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Damn. And he actually studied Chinese Oju under the Black Dragon, Ron Von Cleef, which I mm, guess mm-hmm. means something in, in that community. So, yes, he um, also does, he did fight choreography for a ton of movies. Yeah, and, well, not just a ton of movies, also Madonna's 2001 Drowned World Tour. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was the martial arts coordinator for that. It's important. I'm, uh, I'm intrigued. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> he was also on an episode of MTV Singled Out in 1995. Okay, now I need to so. watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that Jenny McCarthy or is that Carmen Electra? Oh, era? yeah, I don't that, know. That might be Jenny, Jenny McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> John goes, sounds like that was Jenny. <laughs> Jenny hadn't stopped doing it yet. <laughs> I got that one on DVD. Oh. <laughs> He also worked like as an official early days of the UFC. He officiated UFC six and seven. Mm. He was legit in the fight community and like in the martial arts community. Other movies he was in, he was in 99's Dreamers and something called Repeat Offenders in 2011. The acting career really never really took off, but he was heavily involved in a bunch of different types of fighting and choreography. Probably the perfect person to play Bruce Leroy. It's interesting interesting to think too when we look at the actual actors in all the movies that we have this season so we got jcvd and we got that kid that's in no retreat no surrender and just all the people jeff wincott, jeff wincott <laughs> and like, <laughs> we know we got chuck norris coming oh, uh, dawn the dragon yeah dawn the dragon it's it's now now if you if we were to have a real fight between all of them like they're gonna have real, like a real, t- real tournament fight? between all of them. I, I seriously think it's Dawn the Dragon versus Tymok in the yeah. in, in, in the in the finals. Well, if you're not counting Billy Blank, I, <laughs> I, I think you're right. I don't know. I mean, I think you're right, Dominic. Dawn I, Dragon, I'm sorry, I Tymok disagree because JCVD have. wins every time over everything. <laughs> no, no, JCVD or die. No, okay. <laughs> But in this opening scene, Leroy is sad because his sensei is telling him. I can't train you anymore. Telling him to go home. Yeah, he's like basically telling him, I don't like you. Like, I'm kind of tired of you. Can you go home now? <laughs> like, don't worry. You've surpassed everything I know. You got to go and you got to find. You gotta go something different. You, you got to go find. <laughs> some dumb guy. Yes. That's some you, dumb goy. <laughs> some dumb goy is who you need to find. 
<laughs> and then he will help you. Basically, he's telling him he will help you get your glow. If you find him, you will you will reach peak. And that, but, but in reality, he's just tired of him. He's like, I'm tired of you. I, I I'm going to Miami. I'm going to Miami. <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> and realistically, he's giving him a little medallion, and he's basically telling him to find the master. But the master's really in him. Leor thinks that there's actually a master out there that he needs to find. And so that's going to lead to the next, uh, uh, to a lot of fun. One of the things that I love about Leroy in this movie is that he is so freaking oblivious. I was just going to say that. He is the 1985 version of Drax. (laughs) (laughs) He takes everything literally. (laughs) He's very gullible. Mm -hmm. He's very just like point blank. Like, I don't, I don't get it. (laughs) <laughs> I don't really get it. <laughs> it's not until the very end where he finally puts it all together. Yeah, it kicks in the door, some dumb guy, yeah. and he like yeah. argues with them and stuff. It's but not no, until he's, then. Yeah, he's very innocent. I would say too. He's very innocent of the way, of the ways of the world, and the ways of women apparently too. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, this movie teaches Leroy about his special purpose. <laughs> 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 so, what do you do if you've been officially uh, kicked out of karate? You go to the movies. <laughs> I love that he's walking around New York and no one cares. He's wearing his, like, it's not, not like gi, it's like a... No, it's like a kimono. Like a kimono, like, and he's got the set. hat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, but let's talk about the hat. The hat's like a big, like... Like, like a, a straw hat? Like a wicker hat or something? Or? Yeah, like a I wicker hat. I forgot what those are called, yeah. Yeah, he looks like he, he has, has a satellite dish on him. Goofy, big old <laughs> wicker hat. <laughs> so I would have hate to have been a person behind him at the movies. Yeah. And he sits in the front row too. Block everybody up. And why aren't the movies like that anymore? They got a boom box, they're all partying. <laughs> like this is a good time. People are smoking weed. They're dancing in the aisles. Yep. They're yelling at the screen. They're getting into the movie. This is what the movie theater experience should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the last movie theater I went to, there was like five people, and they all decided to sit as close as possible to me. <laughs> <laughs> Why do people do that? It's like when you park way far out, know. but someone has to park right next to you. You're like, I parked like two miles away from the store. Wait, that's a good spot right next to them. <laughs> yeah, it's like they panic. Oh, my God, there's spots everywhere. Where should I park next to them? <laughs> <laughs> They'll know. <laughs> well, John, if you were at the movie alone, people might be like, I'm going to go sit to the, next to the loner white guy just in case <laughs> shit goes down. <laughs> I would think you wouldn't want to sit next to the loner white guy <laughs> checking out the exit. <laughs> I need an aisle seat. <laughs> but then the greatest karate villain in all of karate movies, maybe... There's a, there's some competition from Jim Cotta. This is a different movie. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> we should have included Jim Cotta. <laughs> the greatest villain in all of all time in every karate movie saunters into that theater. The Shogun of he Harlem. Saunter. <laughs> he oh, they, are, in there. they announce him coming in. It's like a dance battle is about to break out. <laughs> The Shogun of Harlem, Shonuff himself. And I, I legitimately mean it. He is the greatest karate villain of all time in any karate movie. He is. A, he could be <laughs> arguably the greatest villain. Think about it. Who's more villainous than him in other movies? He is a true villain. Well, <laughs> and he's a true master, as you find out at the end. He's an actual master. He's so got the glow. He, mm-hmm. like, he's legit. He's got the and glow. Old, he's got it. And, and he's got a posse. Like, the only yes. thing that would make his posse even better is if they were on roller skates. <laughs> they all have great names. It's not just all men, too. It's men yeah, it's and women. women. Yeah. They they go in and mm-hmm. just jack everything up to get their hands on, including shoving Richie into the trash can, which is one <laughs> of the greatest scenes ever. I love <laughs> I love that they get in a fight with the Italian guys. And why is that one fat Italian guy wearing a tube top? <laughs> that bothered me. That was that was wrong. <laughs> he just comes in there, destroys it. What I even think I think they even stopped the movie for him when he comes in, and then they restart it after he like after they're done announcing <laughs> him. He his mission is to fight Leroy because only one stopping him from supreme rulership of Harlem of karate. <laughs> 
is Leroy. Because everyone in the neighborhood of their neighborhood knows that Leroy is the baddest karate expert <laughs> in the four block radius. That's, and that's it. And that's it. Shogun feels like he needs to be the, he, in order to be the baddest man on the block, he's got to be the only other guy on the block that people are scared of. And that's Bruce Leroy, because he is a badass, as we find out, eating popcorn with chopsticks. <laughs> Like you do. <laughs> as soon as show enough comes on screen, because you have the opening of the movie, you're like, okay, it's going to be a karate movie. You get into it. And as so- soon as show enough shows up, the movie changes forever. No karate movie is ever <laughs> the same without show enough. I kept thinking, seeing his crew and those shoulder pads that he wears and everything, like, oh, I get it. I get it. In Harlem, they're karate. Like in Coney Island, they're the Warriors. They're, so this is uh-huh. this is just a spinoff of the Warriors. Yeah, this exactly. is a gang of of the Warriors yeah. in that part of Harlem. Yeah, exactly. It, see, that's I thought the exact same thing. See, we're on the same page here. <laughs> that's why I was expecting the roller skate. I mean, that would have been better. Karate roller skating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tries to challenge Leroy, it doesn't happen, and in the chaos, Leroy just bounces, which he apparently does a lot in this movie. He just, <laughs> he just bounces in the middle like, of the I'm out of here. And then we get this scene, and we meet our kind of bad guys, I guess. The, Secondary the, bad guys. The king of Ohio, uh, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> his slightly dumb, was that his son? Is that supposed to be his son? I think it is supposed to be his son. Because he says, like, how come you never put that into my career, my boxing career, when he talks about how he's trying to make her a star? So I don't know. It's either that or, like, maybe maybe he's just had them. He works for him for so long that they're they're that close and he paid for him to do boxing and he never won a match. <laughs> he's like, I did. You got beat every single time. There was the end of that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he calls him the uh, great white hopelessness. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, so many villains yeah. in this movie to avoid, too, because there's shown up. There's Arcade, Ar- Arcadian, Ar- I can't remember what exactly what his last name is. Uh, Arcadian, Arcadian, sorry. Yeah, Arcadian. If and then little... whatever that fish is that's in that tank. Like a piranha or something. <laughs> well, it, that thing is, I'm not even sure if it's a fish. It might be swamping in there. Wait, <laughs> is it so, Chud? And then just real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Chud. It's New York. It's a Chud. Yes, that makes Chud sense. That makes so much sense. It's a Chud. All right. Because re- so, so remember, guys- sorry, remember with Chud that the motivations of the people that worked there were to kill the co- the corrupt politician, not to actually kill the Chud. No, the Chud's so still alive and well. That, that, that was their priority <laughs> yeah. was to take care of the politician, not the Chud. It's so- like a rat. He just swims right up the pipe. <laughs> Shows up in your toilet. <laughs> just showed up in their indoor aquarium they had. They're feeding him, like, whatever. That was like a pig leg or a, I don't know. Eddie Arcadian, the, like, dad. He's Christopher Mirney. He's known for the movie Barton Fink in 91 and Maximum Overdrive in 86. Uh, but he also vo- voiced a lot of characters in video games I like. Red Dead Redemption, Neverwinter mm. Nights 2, and Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Damn. Plus he did a bunch of TV guest stars and stuff like that. Oh, and he was Otis in Land of the Dead, for all you nerds out there like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Faith Prince, who plays Angela, or Angela Verraco, she was known for the movie Dave in 93 and Drop Dead Diva in 2009. She also did a bunch of TV work, including an ABC family sitcom called Melissa and Joey. Mm. Yes, that Joey. (laughs) Joey Warren. Whoa! (laughs) So, she also does a ton of stage work, too. She actually won a Tony in 92 for Best Mm. Actress for a production of Guys and Dolls. And then Mike Starr plays Rock. And Rock is known for Ed Wood in 94, Dumb and Dumber, 94, he was one of the goons that were chasing Mm -hmm. them, I think. And then Uncle Buck in 89, and Miller's Crossing. Uh, He's actually got 235 acting credits, so I could just keep going. Um, He also played Kenny Sandusky in 45 episodes of the TV show Ed from 2000 to 2002. Mm. If you're wondering what Ed is, Ed, a lawyer who gets fired from his firm and decides to go back to his old... Ohio town he's from and open up a bowling alley and practice law out of the bowling alley. <laughs> you know. Yes. Awesome. Totally TGIF. <laughs> so. 
Meanwhile, over at Seventh Heaven, it's this club that's also on TV. It's a local New York thing. Mostly, you were saying it's not like maybe like an American bandstand because they because they showcase. But the whole point of it is to showcase like top hits, right? This is what they're gonna. What the point of the, her story is that they want to get that <laughs> that very fiery woman singer who <laughs> 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 can't sing that well <laughs> on this on the on the countdown. And you can tell right away that Angela stands no chance because on day one, that when we get introduced to this, they have DeBarge and then Vanity performs. Yeah, so you're like, like <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yes, I don't think Laura's gonna go for you being on there with your like taxi outfit and <laughs> I don't know what the heck's going on. <laughs> yeah, and so and this guy who I guess he calls himself the the video uh, game king or something and he like owns an arcade or something uh and he thinks that somehow he's going to woo vanity who's who's an actual star in the movie and convince her to i don't know back his music video for his uh for angela um, he wants yeah what he, he wants even to... gets he even gets william h macy to try and talk her into it which i thought was <laughs> huge i couldn't believe <laughs> How did he get him to do it? No. Yeah, he wants her to what she has like a list of like the hot five top five songs for the week. And he wants her to include that on the list, her song on the list. Because remember, like when they show her in the club, she's playing bit music videos from other stars. That was another woman singer that, that looked like a terrible song, too. But <laughs> but it was on the list. But yeah, so that's what, he, that's that's what right. he's trying she, to do. She's got her own like, yeah, she's got her own like DJ hour or something yeah. at the club. Yeah. yeah. So it's like her hit list. The top five songs of the week. And he was, if he gets her on there, he figures that, you know, that she's so popular that everyone will run out and buy her album. So, of course, after she tells William H. Macy no, which I can't believe. I mean, I would never <laughs> tell him no. But she tells him no. And he relays that to the video king, Eddie. And he decides that the next best way to do this is to now kidnap her. Yeah. <laughs> Just attack her on the street. Who knows what happened to her actual limo driver because she thinks that Sal is still there, but it's not Sal. And then they pull around the corner and try to. Which they should have just kept driving yeah, in the I don't limo. I understand but. why they pulled around the corner. Like, if you're just going to kidnap her, why'd you pull around the corner? Just take her to where you're going. Con- which also, like, what were they going to do after they kidnapped her? Like, w- when they did it? Like, they're, okay, we ki- we kidnapped you. We've convinced you now. Okay, bye. See you later. <laughs> How is she not uh-huh. going to go to the police and be like, these people kidnapped me and wanted me to play their song? He does it again later in the movie, which we'll get to. But his only plan is to just hold her until she agrees to air it. No no other threats mm-hmm. or anything. He's just going to continue to yell at her until she finally concedes. No, no. He wants to feed her to the fish. <laughs> that's the threat. And that, and then, the, then that's when the girlfriend's the like, chud. that's too much. <laughs> feed her to the chud. To the chud. <laughs> he wants the chudder. <laughs> <laughs> See, but that's the thing is like like each of their kidnapping attempts are just pathetic. So first he hires a bunch of chauffeurs. <laughs> uh, at least I think that's what they are. <laughs> he went to the chauffeur <laughs> union and, and got these guys. <laughs> They're not and Bruce Lee really. just, Yeah, and Bruce uh, and Bruce Leroy just kicks their ass. He kicks one through the limo, and then after he rescues her, they take off. He gets her a cab, and then he just bounces again. Like just takes off. He doesn't have the moves, so he's too <laughs> nervous. To stick around, he does drop his medallion, so that means there is an excuse, or at least Laura re- recognizes, like, hey, if I hold on to this, that guy's going to come back. <laughs> We're going to have to talk to each other again, because she is, even before the fight breaks out, she sees him on the street, and she immediately locks eyes with him. <laughs> and then later, after he rescues her, she goes right back to that. <laughs> she is all about Leroy. And he is very oblivious to it. <laughs> Like he is too much. And, and I love, <laughs> and I love all the chauffeurs go running back to the video game king, and they're like, she had like twenty bodyguards, and they're like <laughs> big black guys with chains. And- yeah. <laughs> And he believes it. He's like, yeah, okay, that sounds right. Not yeah. you, you guys are morons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We finally get to another scene. Because every scene is like whatever something happens and then show enough comes. <laughs> <laughs> we finally get to another show enough scene where Leroy also teaches karate at a school. So he trains with his sensei. He teaches at his own karate school and then just does like karate stuff on the street. Like he just walks around street dressed justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta make your money somehow, man. <laughs> He also works at the pizza place his parents own. <laughs> so he does it all. He's all around. Yeah. He's enterprising. Show enough comes to try to force him to bow before him because he knows that Leroy won't fight him. So he keeps trying to disrespect him in every opportunity he has. 
to get Leroy to finally fight him. And Leroy continues to just refuse to do it, including bowing down and trying to kiss his feet to protect his friend. He will not fight Shonuff in any way, even in that great yellow Bruce Lee jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so as you can imagine it's a pretty rough day so he goes home goes hangs out on a roof more roofs what is with <laughs> roofs guys every movie <laughs> this one did not include dancing though there were no roof dancing <laughs> well while he was becoming one with so his flexible. brain we get to meet <laughs> Uh, Richie, his younger brother. Richie is actually pl played by Leo Bryan, who is the little brother of Guy O'Brien, Master B of the Sh Sugar Hill Gang. No wow. shit. <laughs> yeah. Fun fact there. Richie is easily my favorite side character in this movie. There there's like three main or four main. Leroy, Eddie, Laura, and um Angela. They're like mm -hmm. the four main characters in the Oh, sorry. Show enough. Yeah. Those are the four main yeah. characters, not Angela. And then the side characters like Angela and Richie is by far my favorite side character. And I would actually love to have Richie in more movies just as this character. <laughs> Sassy, foul mouth, <laughs> willing to get in your face, yeah. even if you're way bigger than him. Like he doesn't care. I love, I love, love, love Richie. Even when he gets smashed, gets thrown head first into the trash can. <laughs> I still love Richie. <laughs> Richie promises that he's going to bring Leroy over to seventh heaven. Cause he sees Laura on TV. Like, Hey, I know her. I need to go talk to her. He realizes he's already realized that he's lost his medallion. And Richie says, Oh yeah, I know. I know her. I know Laura. That's my woman. Yeah. She's my woman. <laughs> I sneak into her uh -huh. show every single week. Yeah. <laughs> so now Leroy is going to go back to Seventh Heaven and he's going to see the second kidnapping. Because this poor girl has had a rough kidnapping week. Kidnapping attempt. <laughs> two kidnapping yeah, kidnapping attempt number two, two actually period. goes better, though. <laughs> yeah, they actually get her this time. <laughs> yeah, they actually get her into the van, which is made up to look like a TV van. They get her all the way back to the apartment and make her listen to Angela's horrible, horrible song, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure is about her finding new pictures in her boyfriend's luggage. Yeah. And for some <laughs> reason, that turns her on. Yeah, that's exactly what the song is about. And it was terrible. And that was Laura's punishment I, I for didn't not know playing if it, I, I guess. I was supposed to, yeah, I didn't know if I was supposed to pay attention to the lyrics or not, but I couldn't help it. Like, what, the, what is she saying? What about naked photos? What's she talking about? Yeah. We're all in agreement here because my note I wrote down here is Laura is tortured along with all of us by Angela's music. Yep. <laughs> I think yes. even Angela's tortured by it. She's like, turn it off. She doesn't want to hear anymore. <laughs> my other favorite part from this scene is that Eddie's like, you see her? She sounds great. We have you kidnapped. We have you tied to a chair. The implications are the violence that are going to happen against you if you don't agree with me. You're going to put her on your show, right? And Laura goes, no. Yeah, she's not <laughs> no. afraid at all. Yeah, I, I thought that was funny. She was not scared at all. She's like, no, I'm not actually. But yeah, I got to go. So because I got a show to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then Leroy shows up again. I don't know how he figured it out where she was. Do you think I that forgot. like he would have shown up sooner had he not gone and changed into the all black ninja suit? <laughs> like, yeah, maybe I mean, she, she wouldn't have had... by the time he gets there. <laughs> maybe we would have had to suffer through Angela's song had he not changed. <laughs> Leroy comes in, just destroys all the goons again, and then holds Eddie's face under the water so the chud will come up and try and grab him. <laughs> Pulls him back just in time. And at the end of it, at, at the, the scene is so great because there's so many things in the beginning with Laura just telling him flat out, no, I'm not going to fucking do this no, no matter what you're implying. <laughs> yes. Two, is that at the end, Eddie is like, ah, yeah, okay, yeah, we got destroyed. Time to kill this man. Not once thinking, like, you know what? Maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree here. This is this no, is going no. wrong. Then it becomes he. It's his mission. Like he's gonna do it, whether Angela wants it or not. Because Angela's like, actually, I don't really want it anymore. Like, can we stop doing this now? I'm not really into it. <laughs> <laughs> The last part that's great yeah, is that now Laura... Like, he, like, takes it, off, it takes offense to it. And so it's like, <laughs> now I'm going to make it my mission to make you do it. 
the last part that's great about this scene is that Laura is having a moment. She loves Leroy, and he's in that spandex, <laughs> kicking ass for her. She, ugh, it's it's a swoosh moment. Like that's she's she's having a she moment. Saw, she saw it. She saw the outline. She was like, oh, I've seen it. <laughs> I know the general shape. I'm good. <laughs> then she takes Leroy back to her place and says, hey, are you thirsty? Because nothing can quench my thirst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I am she very is- thirsty. I would like some water. <laughs> this is the beginning of her throwing it at him and him running away every time. Just take a hint. You know? <laughs> she, she, so, of course... Every kidnapping attempt has to be followed up by Shonuff uh, not being <laughs> outdone. So he's going to show up with his camo ninjas and tear up Leroy's family's pizza joint. Just try and entice Leroy to come and fight him. So, which I felt bad for Leroy because he shows up and everyone was like all mad at him like it was his fault. It's like it's not his fault that Shonuff wants to fight him. He didn't antagonize this guy. Can we talk about Leroy's mom and how she's the real badass of the family? She's like, you're destroying my place. You know what? I'm going to throw, I'm going to lob these dough balls at you. And she had like really Perfect good. Perfect accuracy. Yeah, no. <laughs> like three in a row. Uh-huh. Her husband's like, will you stop? And then when they put, <laughs> when they put Richie in the garbage can, she's like, no, you didn't. Like, no. Hold her <laughs> like, no. She turns around, tries to grab more stuff off the shelf to throw. Yeah. Like, pot and stuff. Dad has to hold her down. <laughs> yeah. So then basically, yeah, they're all mad. Then they're mad. Because Richie's mad because he gets put in the garbage can. And so poor Leroy comes back and he doesn't know what the hell's going on. And it's like, he's like, it's your fault because you're a coward. My favorite part of this was that his mom goes and gives him a hug. And she never says, like, it's not your fault. You're not a coward. She just hugs him like, it is your fault. You are a coward. I had to throw dough balls. Perfectly good dough. <laughs> Ruined. <laughs> they put your brother in the trash, for God's sake. <laughs> They come in and destroy this place. We also get a sense of the names of the cronies that work for showing up his posse. Yes. Their names are Crunch, Beast, and Cyclone. <laughs> <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They are serial <laughs> mascots. Show enough is played by Julius Carey. Aside from The Last Dragon, he was in The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. in 93. Mm. The new guy in 02. In a bunch of TV stuff, too, like episodes of Jag and Columbo. Um, unfortunately, Julius Carey passed in 2008. Mm. So we won't be getting any uh, show enough reunions, unfortunately. He did such a great job in this movie because it's a balance between with it being a comedy. So he needs to be over the top and comedic. Well, but not being so far cartoonish that it makes it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is car- cartoony, but he's not. He has to be scary. It's not though. cheesy. Yeah, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, he has to still be threatening and scary, yeah. and he still is, even though he's like way over the top, and he really is a character, maybe like a comic book character or something like that. That's what you could characterize it. But he's still scary. Like you're still like, I don't want to fight him in the street or his cronies. <laughs> So now Leroy's got to go and let off some steam. He's adamant. <laughs> he is not going to use his karate for violence, but he's going to go beat up that p- punching bag. Then he kneels down to do his meditation after doing let off the steam and hitting the bag. And Laura comes in. She's like, how am I interrupting you? Hello, I'm talking to you. Hello. Are you listening to me? I mean, I'm just like, you're busy, but are you? <laughs> she's like, would you rather I leave? And then she just comes in. She's like, I didn't get a chance to answer, but okay. <laughs> well, I mean, she wants to hire him a- as like a bodyguard and he's like no no i don't want to be a bodyguard i've got this journey find some dumb guy um <laughs> you know this like, like, like shut up man just be the bodyguard <laughs> have you ever even seen the bodyguard she doesn't even phrase it as bodyguard she phrases it as guard my body yeah mm. yeah. Mm. yeah she wants him to do all kinds of things <laughs> you'd, yeah you'd have to be with me at all times all times <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Video King Arcade, uh, they're taking Hitman applications, <laughs> and apparently the barking guy seems promising, but he might be a little on the expensive side. <laughs> How do you get that out there? Like, where do you put that? What kind of paper do you put that in? We need, <laughs> we need uh, killers, please. <laughs> People that bark like a dog. People oh. that are wearing a wrestling singlet, but are not going to wrestle anyone. <laughs> no. <laughs> just some old guy. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can't just like put that in the penny saver. You know, that's just. Uh... 
<laughs> it's also an important scene because Angela realizes and calls out Eddie on his shenanigans. He tries to tell her, you would be nothing without me. And she says, you'd be nothing. You Sorry, a quote. You would be nothing but a midget asshole getting by on her tits. Yeah, well, I mean, it's true. And her mm-hmm. tits are actual headlights. Yeah, and so. we find... <laughs> <laughs> at, at, this, at that point, her, her breasts were actual headlights in her costume. Yes. So he really yes. couldn't get by without her. <laughs> all that talent. She well, got mega all, talent. <laughs> and and we also find out that she went to uh she was going to dental school when they met. So I was like, well, she actually had her crap together. Like he's dragging her down. Okay, but not to be a dentist, right? She was gonna be a dental tech. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's probably more like a DeBry type school or something, but still, that's pretty good. I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. It's great for Angela. (laughs) At the same time, over at Show Nuffs, he's just destroying his crew. And they're not doing it for any reason other than just showing up (laughs) wants to fight. Just fun. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, he's not not even there for the job. It's just normal gang stuff, just (laughs) hanging out. They're looking to hire Shonuff as one of the additional goons. We just beat each other. (laughs) (laughs) They're looking to hire Shonuff as being another one of the goons. And Shonuff says, I'll do it for free. You just get Leroy to this spot at the right place, the right time. Because I want a piece of him. I don't, you don't even have to pay so, me this briefcase of money. Yeah, but I mean, so show enough's not the brightest. Bull. <laughs> Take the money anyway. I mean, he he wants to pay you. I mean, I get it. You still know you you would do it for free, but he's actually going to give you that briefcase regardless. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> just take the money man like don't give it back you guys i mean they could they could he could upgrade the gang headquarters you know <laughs> double the space a couple beat up cars to you know his Who cronies knows? could have real names <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> to give, him they could have- cards. <laughs> <laughs> give him some last names <laughs> Cyclone Stevens. <laughs> How do you know Cyclone's not his last so, name? So now- Jimmy Cyclone. <laughs> Jimmy Cyclone. <laughs> yeah. So while this is going on, we have Bruce Leroy. Now he's like going on a date with Vanity. Um, and, and they're like driving into the car, and there's this whole "Let me tell you about my crazy moment." When he starts telling her about glowing and like, uh, like his crazy Bruce Lee theories and stuff. So also, I was like, also he doesn't have any moves and is a virgin. Yeah, but that wasn't him. Yeah. That was his friend. His friend. He has a friend yes. who doesn't know about moves. Not not me. Not me. Not me. <laughs> he needs, yeah, he I mean, have any that, moves. <laughs> if that car conversation didn't chase her away, nothing was going to at that point. <laughs> And she's like, she doesn't get it. She's like, what do you mean moves? Like karate moves? Or like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, it's not me. Not me. It's my friend. (laughs) My friend. My friend doesn't have any moves like with women. Oh. And why why is he glowing? I don't understand. (laughs) They're on their way to seventh heaven. And inside, she's going to show them a special mix that clearly she created. That's got music set to Bruce Lee fighting scenes, which is giving Leroy the biggest boner. (laughs) It's so funny when she starts it. He's like, oh my God, that's Bruce Lee. She's like, I know I made it. Like (laughs) I was there. I put it together. It's like it's it's specially made for you. I know who that is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. She is pouring it on trying to get his pants off. And she's almost does it. And then he has this like moment where he sees like, oh my God, the the disguise movie, you know, that gives me a great idea. And he bounces again. And I feel so bad for her because at this point, like, she's trying everything to get in his pants. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time as this is happening outside, Richie and his crew are just staking out the joint. He's waiting for Laura to show up. And Richie has been inconsolable since he has found out that Laura and his brother are a thing. Leroy are a thing. And he has been just beside himself. He cannot fathom that she is attracted to him. And he thinks he's just going to wait it out with his with his crew until she shows up. Which I love his crew. Especially the white kid that wears the funky hats. <laughs> and like the shirts that are like three sizes too small for him. <laughs> yeah. And then they hear hey, music man. inside. 
<laughs> and then they hear music inside, and it was just, I know how to get up there. Let's go up the fire escape, and they got to pull the fat kid up. Like, you can't <laughs> climb like, Help, up. I can't get there. up. <laughs> That's why he needs the hats, though. He's got to have something to stand out. <laughs> he needs help getting on the fire escape. You gotta have a jaunty hat to make him look not as chunky. <laughs> it's like the fat kid sidekick, you know. It's it's, it's just it's 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 a necessity. <laughs> Richie comes running in and he sees Leroy and Laura making out. You inscrutable chop sockle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just lobbing some big words at him. <laughs> then Leroy leaves. Richie leaves. He comes storming back in, Richie does, and sees that Laura is being kidnapped, goes to run away again, yes. then decides, no, never mind, I'm going to come in and I'm going to try and save her, and gets kidnapped himself. Great job, Richie. Yes, this <laughs> leads us to kidnapping number three. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about Sum Dumb Goy and the guys that work at Sum Dumb Goy. Well. <laughs> They're popping and locking on the street. They're they, doing they, all they, kinds of stuff. They do their thing. They're just there. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy is uh, so, big. No, let's, let's Let's talk about the disguise a little bit, the sunglasses and the hat, because that's going to make him like that completely changes his look, sunglasses and a hat. <laughs> like that's he's all trying, he does. Like He's trying to sneak in by delivering a pizza then he can get to the master that's inside of some dumb goy. After they give him a runaround, ste- stealing his money on games that they make up on gambling games, they make up. He finally, they finally convince him to stand outside and wait for the master to come to get him. And he realizes he's just been pushed outside and they're not going to let him in anymore. Yeah. These um, guys are having a good old time. They're shooting craps. They're getting high. They're just hanging out. Um, yeah, and then finally we- he's had enough and he busts in and it turns out that the master is a fortune cookie machine. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I honestly I've got to call uh shenanigans right there. Everybody knows that all fortune cookies are made at the same company, uh, 90 something percent of them are at the same company in Oakland uh down by Jack London Square. I used to drive by <laughs> it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 I think they hold the patent on it, so they have to get them from there. Um, <laughs> most places don't make their own cookies. I'm just, spend, I'm saying, my knowledge of fortune Oakland. cookies tells me that this is not right. <laughs> They're going to be in some legal trouble here. <laughs> Eddie has tied up Laura and Richie at Seventh Heaven. Leroy's having a night. He goes from the club to some dumb goy, back to his gym back to some dumb goy then to his senseis where sensei tells him like you moron i've been trying to tell you this whole time it's in your head and your heart you got to figure it out on your own there ain't no master now excuse me i'm leaving i'm going to (laughs) miami to visit my brother (laughs) mom he's gonna go visit oh his mom yeah yeah so and he still doesn't get it he leaves there somehow still wondering who the master is (laughs) because he's not the brightest okay (laughs) It doesn't dot on to him until he's actually in a fight in the fight with Shoga. So, but now he's got to go rescue Vanity yet again. And this time also rescue Richie. Yes. So we go back to Seventh Heaven. And just by the way, I love the fact that Laura is tied up, not gagged. Richie tied <laughs> up and gagged. We all know why. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He was just running his mouth. <laughs> Leroy shows up, makes quick work of the first round of goons. Then more goons come, and they actually get the upper hand on him. But then the karate studio that he teaches at come running in, they start t- to defend him. Which that little kid, he should have been involved from the very beginning. Yeah. He's kicking ass. He's a badass. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Eddie realizes this isn't going to work out. I got to get sh- him to show enough and just Leroy and show enough to have the final battle. Eddie's out of his mind, but... He's going to get this final battle. So he's going to lure Leroy out of the arcade or out of seventh heaven over to a different building. And that's where show enough is waiting for him. And show enough is destroying Leroy in this fight. Oh yeah. And he starts to, he would start to glow red with his punches and kicks and stuff. So like he is truly master. He is a legit villain. There was no way unless Leroy figures out how to get the glow. There's no way he would be able to defeat Shonuff, which is why Shonuff was constantly looking for him Mm -hmm. because he knew that he had to get to him before he reached that higher level. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, of course, Leroy refuses to give up. He's going to keep fighting. 
to the very, very end. And he finally realizes, all I have to do is believe in myself. It's been within me this entire time. And that's when he finally gets the glow. And his glow is better because it's not just blue it's blue and gold so it's like (laughs) double like two colors (laughs) Leroy destroys Shona then Eddie realizes okay we're at the end of this I have to go to the final my final option here which he pulls a gun on Leroy shoots him Laura and Richie think he's done for now but Leroy caught the bullet in his teeth and then just ties up Eddie into the chains and lifts him up and then disappears into the night again when the cops show up but Eddie is like I can't believe you did that I'll we should get joined together and we could take you on like the road like a sideshow and he's like trying to tell him like I'll give you this percentage and then yeah. oh no wait okay I'll give you all the money just give me a finder's fee. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's just beside herself. She doesn't understand why she hasn't seen Leroy since he left. They're having a big party at the club. Richie's on the floor doing his moves, and then that's when Leroy comes in in this special kimono. But he's got flowers, and he's it's there. The sex kimono. <laughs> <laughs> you might. <laughs> It's the sex kimono, which is also referred to as a Seagal. (laughs) (laughs) That's why Steven wears them. (laughs) And that's the end of the movie. We don't see if they have sex, though. (laughs) Did he have moves or not? (laughs) What a rip off that is. Last week, no sex time with the chud. (laughs) This week, no sex time with the chud. Actually, I think I would have rather seen the sex time with the chud at this point. Just to see what it looked like. (laughs) I mean, they can do that weird neck thing. I wonder if that applies to other body parts. <laughs> and that's this movie. I love it. There's there's a million reasons to watch it again and again and again. It never gets yes. old. And I'm just so sad that I didn't get this chance to see it at the Animal Draft House before the virus came and destroyed the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And everything around it. <laughs> but before we get into our final thoughts, let's go talk about the music. Obviously, obviously, this is much different music than most movies in this season in fact it might be more different in music than any movie we've watched so far when we pivoted to movies so let's go take a look at what this music is in the last dragon all right john this movie is produced by motown records i have a feeling this soundtrack is stacked what do you got for us this week yeah so i mean motown they have access to so much so of course it was going to be stacked uh, lineup and I could have gone a lot of different directions because it includes music from uh, which was new music at the time from artists like Stevie Wonder and Smokey Robinson and there's a Temptation song uh, wow. the title song for the movie was written by Norman Whitfield who's a famous songwriter for Motown and wrote a, and co-wrote a bunch of hits for the Temptations and a bunch of other artists Jackson 5 and stuff some of the lesser known artists on there was like Shirley who was Charlene Marilyn Oliver. So she was kind of a one-hit wonder with the hit I've Never Been To Me. But it's shown up a lot in the media over the years, appearing in TV shows like Will and & Grace, and Desperate Housewives, and movies like Shrek 3, uh, Shrek the Third, mm-hmm. um, among others. Uh, yeah, I know what that song is. It's like a... I would have never known that uh, she only had one hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, there was a lot of music to choose from willie hutch he has a song on there he wrote songs for the jackson five and Smokey robinson he also did a lot of soundtracks for black exploitation movies even had a couple disco hits the barge like we mentioned earlier and or the, the barge family which if you read a biography that the barge family is as interesting as any of very Jackson 5-ish. The family featured Mark, Randy, L, and then later Bunny, James, Bobby, and Chico would join. The band was together from 1980 to 1989 and known for dance hits like Love of the Night, but ended right around the time when Bobby and Chico would be arrested for drug trafficking in 89. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that took a <Yeah>. turn. <laughs> <clears throat> Like, I'm serious. Like, they need to make a movie about the debarches because, like, there's all kinds of stories about drug addiction and, and crime stuff. Like, it's, it's pretty crazy. Another artist on the soundtrack was Rockwell, who is Kennedy William Gordy and it's Barry Gordy's son. Uh, mm. He's also known for the song Somebody's Watching Me, which oh. featured his childhood friend, 
Michael Jackson and Brother Jermaine and was a number two song in the U.S. for a while. So his other big song was Obscene Phone Caller. So I mean, the first but, song, the first song is Mike. great. That is such a fantastic song. The second one just sounds creepy. <laughs> but I mean, also that somebody's watching me and then you're an obscene phone caller. Was it like a part two? Is that what's going on? <laughs> All of that on the soundtrack. I want to talk about Vanity, guys. And I left her out of cast star so I could talk about it here. Vanity played Laura Charles in the movie. Obviously, I kept calling her Vanity. I kept forgetting her name was Laura Charles. <laughs> <laughs> she was born Denise Katrina Matt. She's a Canadian singer, songwriter, actress, model, and dancer. Or, <clears throat> um, and she was originally from Niagara Falls, Ontario. So mm. she's Canadian, guys. <clears throat> Canadian. <laughs> hey. So she won some local beauty pageants, moved to Toronto, kept winning beauty pageants, won Miss Niagara 1977, went on to compete for Miss Canada 1978, and then moved to New York and got signed by a modeling agency and went big time. She had a few small B-movie roles before she would meet Prince at the American Music Award, where she was a date for Rick James. Mm, weird. She'd end up dating Prince and she would even say in interviews that he pretty much created the whole vanity persona. And actually later Later in an interview, she would say that she she would talk about that she actually didn't like the vanity persona at mm. first, and uh, mm -hmm. Prince was like, "Well, that's you know, I want you to lead this the this group, Vanity Six. So if you want to get paid, you're going to be Vanity." <laughs> Damn. I mean, so it's also hard to question it. Prince. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it worked. Turned her into a pop star. So, but she got tired of Vanity Six and wanted to branch out on her own. In 1984, she uh, would move over to Motown. And that's why she would end up in this movie in 1985. Uh, she would release two albums with Motown. Both would be mildly successful with a few singles charting. And she would star in The Last Dragon. After The Last Dragon, she would be in Never Never Too Young to Die with John Stamos and Gene Simmons. Guys, we are we are going to have to watch that movie. Uh, we've it seen it. It <laughs> is amazing. Oh, yeah. It is amazing. Gene Simmons' character is so weird. His gang rides on mo motorcycles that are dressed up to look like horses. And they also wear women's lingerie. Uh, so there's yes. that. But <laughs> no. John Stamos is very young and very fresh and very new into acting. <laughs> But amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for every Vanity movie well, because I go... know the next one is, and I'm I'm here for that movie too. <laughs> well, she would do go from that, do something called 52 Pickup, and then she would do Action Jackson, which would be her highest grossing role. Uh, yeah. Uh, she would go from the uh huh. She would go from there and guest star in a bunch of 80s and 90s TV shows. She would do Playboy in 88, and in 87. And she would announce her engagement to Motley Crue's Nikki Six, mm. and that is when she would just do a ton of drugs, a ton of drugs, because it's Nikki <laughs> Six. And so, I mean, if you've read his biography, just an insane amount of drugs, so much drugs. Hair bands have ruined so many things, and their music wasn't even that good, like across the board, except for Bon Jovi. We <laughs> take Bon Jovi and Def Leppard out of it. The rest of the hair bands, they ruined so much things with drugs and and them like. Just a whole era of music ruined. What are you talking about? <laughs> Molly Crew ruined Vanity, <gasps> and I'm upset about it. Well, I'm sure they oh. ruined a lot of women. Not well, <laughs> they, they did... <laughs> They did so much drugs that by 1992, she converted to Christianity. And in 1994, she would, had to be rushed to the hospital for three months for a kidney failure from mm. a drug overdose. And yeah. that's when she'd actually get her life together. She would get sober. And a year after getting sober, she would see Oakland Raiders defensive end Anthony Smith. And mm. she would decide she had to meet him. And in 1995, after only knowing him for three days, she proposed to him. They were married Damn. it was a very tumultuous marriage and eventually got divorced and so and right after about the about the time they got divorced he started murdering people anthony smith murdered three people and is still in jail by the way that is a crazy story in its own Damn. so he started murdering people in 1999 by the way so uh, they didn't actually put him in jail for murder until like 2010 Wow. After leaving Anthony Smith, she would need a kidney transplant in 97. And uh, eventually she would get really into, like, uh, really into the church and going around and talking at churches and performing at churches. Kind of did that for, like, the 
the rest. Uh, she didn't do much after that. Unfortunately, she passed in 2016 from kidney failure at the age of 57, which Prince also Prince also died in 2016 at 57 as well. So James yeah, went there. That was a rough, but, rough time period mm. but yeah vanity had a, you know that's a hell of a biography you know um and she was great in her time so yeah exactly and that's what i'm saying with the movies too like everything that she's in no matter how bad the like people say the movies are i love them i yeah. love never too young to die i love action jackson i love the last dragon like there should have been more movies with vanity in it exactly <laughs> We missed out. Uh-huh. <laughs> By the way, this featured her hit song, Seventh Heaven. So I know mm. where they named the club Seventh Heaven. So, ah, uh, okay. Cross branding. Ah, I get it. Uh, see? See? Subliminal mm-hmm. messaging. See? Yep. <laughs> Very Gordy, man. He knows his business. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts because I could spend all night talking about the music in this movie, not just for the people who appeared, but then also Vanity and Barry Gordy and Motown and all the connections with Motown. Like I could just talk about that all night. So let's let's go give our final thoughts on this instead of talking about those things. We'll have to save that one for later. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, I'm going to have you kick off on our final thoughts here. What are your final thoughts on The Last Dragon? I have nothing negative to say about this movie. I love this movie. It is so much fun. I, that, I think that's what the best part about this movie is. It's so much fun. And there's actual good fighting. There's good karate. There's good bite sequences. And like we've talked about several times already, Shonuff is a bad guy. He is a he is a fantastic villain. And he's also like a huge character that you kind of you kind of root for him because he's such a weird character. And he's got like this band of misfits that he's taken under his wing <laughs> and named them all these wacky names. And it's a bunch of minorities and women. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what could go wrong there? But of course, Leroy is so cute and innocent and he has no moves. And <laughs> I just want him to have sex by the end of the movie. <laughs> Finally get that man something. <laughs> He's sweet. I mean, yeah, there's, there's nothing bad to say. I love it. It's got good karate. It's got a good villain. It's, you know, like there's nothing bad about it. Yeah, I love this movie. And I've talked about it in every moment that it came up. Show Enough is great. I wish it was a separate Show Enough movie. It's yeah. just about him. <laughs> Leroy, great. <laughs> Arcadian, great. The subplots, great. I mean, it's just, it has so much fun. It has a message. It's, it's the same message that we have across a whole bunch of different karate movies, which is do the right thing. Don't use it for violence. Just be a great guy. You know, the same about being a good person that's what all the good karate movies are about and that's what's bad about deadly bet because he's just a degenerate and that's what's good about the last dragon and miami connection and no retreat no surrender is that just be good at all costs and that's what i love about the last dragon is that he has that same mentality do the right thing be good always you know take care of uh, other people above yourself has a great message with a goofy over the top villain with a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously and there's everything to love about the last dragon that i don't know what else i can add to that john what are your final thoughts so i completely agree i love this movie i i and i i laugh every time uh every time i watch it it's it's got good comedy and it's a great it's like an ode to bruce lee set in Harlem. and i think when you watch it there are some parts that are obvious Polls from Bruce Lee movies, but there's stuff that's even subtle, um, that's even more subtle. Like, like the movie theater scene is pulled from a, a Bruce Lee movie. The, the now I, we talked about it before we started in pre-show. The disguise scene they show you, which is more obvious, and then there's the, the scene at the end when he fights Shogun, which is kind of we we were talking about, which is kind of game of death. So like, there's a lot of little even subtle nods to the Bruce Lee movie, and they do it in such a fun way to kind of tie in and. And kind of do a Bruce Lee kind of style movie. Because this is, if you've ever watched the Bruce Lee movie, he's always, he's never trying to get into a fight with anybody. He always kind of just kind of falls into it. And then he's always kind of just trying to defend someone's honor or something. So it it just, it fits so well with that genre. And it's so much fun with the, 
with the great Motown music and with Ty Mock just being a, and Vanity just being a fun pair. And it did really good too. I think it grossed like 25 million. So it was really, it was pretty successful in, in the 80s when it came out. So it's just a great movie. And I think when we get done with the season, Ty Mock's no joke. He has some legit black belts. And so he's very likely to be in the finals of our little tournament here. So New York is very well represented with Bruce Leroy he gets a lot of respect points for beating Shogun, who is, like we said, master. His skill and his... It comes through in the movie, too, that he actually knows what he's doing. And that's why we always, or at least I do, I'm always complaining about the lack of respect for Billy Blanks that he's in movies, but he doesn't get like a main part uh -huh. in it. Because he's another one of those guys that's a total <laughs> freaking badass. He just put him on screen, damn it. But did we talk about that Billy Blanks almost got this job, but then... <laughs> Time -ock. Yeah, they decided Take to go out. With, Ty with Time Ock. <laughs> yeah, they could have been Billy in this movie, which it leaves me very conflicted because <laughs> your love for Time Billy is great, <laughs> but I man, I love Billy Blanks. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't have another Billy Blanks movie. I love Billy, but we needed Time Ock. We needed someone else. <laughs> and that's gonna do it for us this week on Go with the Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. We did get some emails that came in after talking about Chud, and we talked about that you should watch it. We did get an email. We got an email from Steve, who supports my effort to get us to watch the raid. And I'm not going to end. <laughs> we got we heard from multiple people on this, and Steve sums it up fantastically. Says that we should watch the raid. And here's why I want to watch the raid, because then that means that we can get to the raid, too. He says, quote, but hands down, the raid, too, is, in my opinion, one of the best martial arts movie of any era. It's a long one, but there are so many sequences where you're just left staring at the screen in disbelief at what they managed to pull off. The final fight sequence is simply amazing. Listen, people, we got to watch the raid. That way we can get to the raid, too. I, Steve's <laughs> got my back on this one. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I'm going to take Steve's recommendation, I guess, and we're going to watch the raid. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we want to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. We also would love your support. Support step number one, go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and leave us a review. Leave us five stars. Even if you don't like us, just give us five <laughs> stars. What do they care? They don't even know. <laughs> if you don't like us, why are you listening to this right now? Oh, I need to know that. <laughs> Just give us five stars. Then in the review, because no one ever reads the reviews, I want you to write a show enough spinoff movie and what that movie would be about. Maybe it's a prequel. Maybe it's an origin story. Maybe it's after he loses to Leroy. Write your spinoff movie for show enough in the description of Podcatcher. Support step number two. Hey, we'll take your money. You can go to the website, go with the heat.com, go to support. <laughs> There's places where you can give us money. Patreon, PayPal. Uh, I, I don't even remember all the places that are up there to be able to give us money. But hey, I guess what I'm saying is. I'm pretty sure we take, we accept food stamps. <laughs> What I'm saying is that if you ran into us at the airport, would you buy us a Starbucks? If that answer is yes, then send us that Starbucks money. That way we can go get it. That way we can actually go get it. Yeah, Starbucks is expensive. We need monies. <laughs> So go to that website, click on support, find it all the other ways that you can support us. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.